We are thrilled to be able to bring you this very important webinar, Sell Your Business at a Higher Profit. And those of you joining us may be thinking about selling your business someday, but hold on because we are going to help you discover how proper planning can live to higher profits. So let me introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce John D'Onofrio. John is the president of D'Onofrio Inc., which provides quality, personalized financial guidance to local individuals and businesses. D'Onofrio Inc.'s expertise ranges from basic tax management and accounting services to more in-depth services, such as estate planning, financial statements, and financial planning. Welcome, John. Welcome. Welcome. And I'm, I'm on my 20th anniversary, and January 1st was 20 years, so... You know, yeah. it's, uh, it feels good. It feels good. I went through a lot uh, to get to the 20 years, but welcome. Wow. Fantastic. So happy to have you here. Real pro. <laughs> Next. Trying, trying. <laughs> Next, please meet Tom Doggis, your trusted business transition advisor in the intricate world of business transition and succession planning. With decades of experience, Tom is not just a business transition advisor. He's your compass on the journey to reaping the rewards of your hard earned success. How wonderful is that? Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. Happy to be here and happy to share some cool information about your future. Absolutely. So so tell us, Tom, about proper planning. So just quickly, in terms of thinking about your business, it may be in transition. It may be succession or it may be an exit. That's a journey that someone, that a business owner takes over their lifetime. So there's different stages. And essentially the benefit to proper planning is to make sure at the end of your journey, whenever you decide that you're gonna take the foot off the gas, slow down or not work at all, that you have the financial independence to live your lifestyle the way you want to. It's, it's very important to work backwards from kind of counterintuitive backwards from, you know, now. So you have to envision the future of your financial future when you're not working anymore, which might be difficult because if you love your business, which I'm sure mo most, if not all of you do, you want to keep working, but also enjoy the fruits of your labor. So understanding how to get that financial security what the roadmap is, how long it takes, um, and what are all the different steps along that path. Um, that's the benefit to, to proper planning, which could take, you know, a couple of years for some people, five, 10 years or more. It all depends. Um, there's also hidden benefits. Um, uh, so John and I work uh, as lead advisors. If you have lead advisors, it takes the pressure off the business owner. The business owner, in, in our cases, don't have to be the leader because you're leading many processes throughout your day. You know, everyone's coming to you for answers, questions in, in all aspects of the business. This is one area in this journey of exiting or succeeding out of your business where you have leaders that like business advisors like ourselves that actually take the burden away and our interview process is such that we're asking you how you want things to look down the road and we're the guides we're the advisors the sherpas if you will to help you up and down that mountain of your business along the way small but you know small and medium-sized business owners don't necessarily think about that right they're used to being lean and mean and everyone wearing a lot of hats and you know that that doesn't lead to the best scenario in in preparing your business. That's why having kind of, as you said, the Sherpas, the coaches, is so very important. Yeah, you Absolutely. want to strategize. You want to you want to strategize now, like Tom's saying, in order to make sure that you know when we are ready, it's there. We don't have to jump through hoops on six months before you want to leave. We have everything implemented. So, you know, tax wise, there's other things, you know, buy sell agreements, everything we're going to go through, Tom and I. But at the end of the day, you just need to make sure that you're set up so that when you are ready to exit, right, there's there's going to be less of a tax burden and you have the options of what you want to do. 
um, and these seven steps, which you know Tom will start, will will basically go through the scenarios how we do it now. We're not ready yet, but how we're going to do it in the future. And one thing I would, uh, you know, um, a lot of my experience, I see um, business owners, which is common. You know, oh, I'm I'm not ready to exit, or I'm I'm not going to sell my business. Kind of like what John said, it's always good to have the information early than later because there is there's several aspects of this planning that do occur initially and and you'll see in in the first couple of steps and then there's middle steps and then there's the end steps so um, being educated is kind of why why we're here yeah you can't go back in time you know you can't take a look at your business and say oh i should have i would have i you know, so the earlier, the better, truly. I mean, I'm sure you help people at all different stages of the process, but certainly, you know, taking the step to be here on this webinar and learn about this and getting a jump on it as soon as possible can only put you in a more advantageous position. Yes, and, and we always we always know there's the why why you wouldn't want to do it or why you don't do it. There's, there's plenty of those reasons. They're all valid, right? Um, but we're here to try to help move, you know, one degree forward, you know, small steps versus doing nothing. And, um, you know, we're aware of how stressed life is as a business owner. We're both business owners. Um, so there's a nurturing aspect to this process also because it, it is long. It can be long and it can be arduous and it could be filled with changes and life events and different things that occur planned and unplanned so you know we've seen that and you know we're expecting that going in so um it, it's 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 you know that's what we're here to try to it's it's not just a quantitative exercise it's there's a lot of qualitative aspects to this process very important you don't want to miss out on opportunities and that's something you can help people ensure that those opportunities aren't missed the ups and downs of life unfortunately we can't help you with <laughs> necessarily but the planning and the preparation and you know all these steps that you can make sure that you don't miss opportunities um that can be there for you in your business and and on the on the way out keep more money in your pocket as well you know this is the strategies how we can keep more money in your pocket upon the sale of your business because look i've been doing it for 20 years so at the end of the day i know it's you know it's it's so hard it's like it's your baby this is this is basically 20 years of of sweat and you know obviously my i have employees so you really want to make sure that you know maybe on the way out if there's people that have been with you for 25 years or so you know you want to take care of them and we basically can just show you a framework of how you want to, you know, you don't, you don't have to follow every step, but we're going to show you what the various steps are and where you can benefit from these steps, right? Where you can choose the best avenue for you, your business, because everybody is complete. One is not, it, it's, it's not, um, you know, straight across the board. Everybody has a, a, a little variance and we have to implement that into the plan itself. Fantastic. Are you ready to jump into the steps? Should I share that with everybody? Yeah, that would that'd be great. Perfect. And I'm not going to take any credit. These are all Tom steps. Yeah. I could just uh what's it called. I could definitely talk about them, but they're uh Tom created seven steps. They're they're <laughs> actually from a very reputable, some of you may have heard this, maybe not. The Business Enterprise Institute created this framework. Um I happen to be licensed as a certified business exit planner. So that's where I, you know, just like you guys know that some a great idea always comes from somebody else and not necessarily yourself. So I'm just kind of stealing what I've been trained on. Um, but this that's framework. I want people to do too. It's like, you know, you have to find the right resources and that's exactly. what you can do for other people. And, and that's what you're sharing here, the right resources. Exactly. And and just as you hear us and think about this, one thing that's important about this framework is that it is a structure. If we didn't follow a structure with clients, we'd be in a willy nilly kind of scenario um, just because that's the way life goes. Um, I also want to mention that thinking about this in a very intentional way is critical to the success and keeping on track. So 
It's the intentional aspect of planning that makes this work um, because the, the framework is no good without that kind of mindset. Um, so, you know, just similar to how we talked about in the beginning, um, there's obviously seven steps here. Step one is really working with a business owner to try and understand where they're at, what's going on, what are their objectives, where are they in their business, how long have they been in business, how long till they, th they think they may want to stop working. So the timing piece is critical. And again, it can change. Um, you know, when I meet with a business owner for the, for the first time, you know, they usually don't know exactly what their business is worth. Okay. Um, it's important to get a grounding in that because we're going to work from that standpoint, right? What it's worth. So this thing on the screen called post ownership lump sum, that really means, okay, if I sold my business someday, what would what would I generate in terms of hard dollars? And then how would that translate into a paycheck? All of that is kind of identified up front and it, and it, and it goes throughout all the steps. It's going to change as the business changes, as it grows and it evolves. And, you know, you have as a business owner, the last say about the successor. Okay. Whether we're talking about someone inside the company or a third party, which we'll get into you're designing the exit with us. Um, you created the business and you have visions. Um, so, and we're here to help kind of make those come true. Um, John, any, any other? Well, anything with that, Tom, just like the timing, we're not sure maybe we want to do this in five years, maybe we want to do it 10 and the post ownership. Look, at the end of the day, we're business owners. Obviously, you know, we're going to create, we're going to create value with assets. Maybe we bought a rental property. Maybe we put money into a retirement account. But at the end of the day, if you want to relax, which obviously we want to retire, would be the the ideal objective is we got to figure out what you need to live on, right, post the business. So we have to factor in, besides any, any of your other assets, what that money would generate. What are we going to generate from there in order to utilize that for our retirement and relax and see the fruits of our labor? Um, that's really a major aspect of this because, you know, we worked 20, 30 years we're in the business here. How much are we going to get upon a sale? And we want to make sure that we get as much as top dollar for hours. And if we have to implement something during the process, we're going to implement it to make that number a better number for you and your family, because this is, this could be generational too, right? This could be money to be generational. So, we really need to figure out really what you want to do. And look, things might change because you might have an employee that started recently um, and five years down the road, you happen to be, you know, an individual that we know could come up maybe some money for a down payment or something to that nature and might want to take over. So these are the things that we have to um, discuss. And those are the, the is what you're looking for, what you're looking to get out of this entire thing. And that's important, John, that, that that can change over time. And that's why yeah. you, it's really, you keep a relationship with people over time because you're kind of checking in to see, do those things have the, do those things change over time, what your needs are and, um, you know, what, what you're going to need to live. And, and exactly. And, you have to adapt to your situation. Mm -hmm. Important. Yep. Thank you. So if we move, it, move into step two, so, you know, Benchmarking the value of the company um, is important. And there's a couple of levels that people like John could help with because it, you know, the first wave is taking your tax returns and putting it through uh, some cash flow and business value uh, programs that we have. And it can generate a paper value just for, just for businesses that have no idea. Okay. We all know the tax return is just one way of looking at it. It might not really be the exact value of the company. You might need someone like John to come in or your accountant to come in and really do a valuation of the company. Um, and then down the road, the valuation is critical because no one's going to strike a check for a company that their accountant hasn't looked at the valuation. So the valuation becomes alive when we start this process and it's, it ebbs and flows, but it's something that we're always looking at to substantiate 
and bring together, you know, the the step one and and the final step in the exit when you when you finally you know are not working anymore and and the business is out of your hands. Um, in all of that is you know looking at cash flows, you know how the business has been doing, what's the liquidity of the business, is any money at all flowing into personal assets? Um, so you know even even someone that's not a business owner, right? Just to put this in perspective. You either have to save money or figure out how to create wealth on your personal balance sheet or your business balance sheet and then transfer it to your personal balance sheet. So you're always trying to get the money out of the business unless you're going to work until, you know, you're you're 100 years old. But most people want, you know, some breathing room there and enjoy life. So taking into account, you know, what we said earlier. If a business owner makes two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, you know, or five hundred thousand dollars a year, and they're approaching the exit plan, the goal, so you guys know, is for us to create that income stream, create that paycheck, create that same lifestyle, and it's a combination of personal assets that you may have, or if everything's in the business, that's fine too. But the business is illiquid, and we need to sell it, obviously, to generate. Um, that post sale lifestyle. Um, so that's step two. Um, I know John probably could um, and, and chime in. You, on, oh, sorry, Tom. Yeah, I know we could chime in on on the valuation and the tax part of this because um, it's very important. Yeah, a, a major, you know, a major part, Tom, of what this one is too is the business valuation. I just want you to understand, everyone can be different and. You, I just don't want you to look at the net income of your business to say that's the net income of of um, of my business itself. It's actually not because, look, at the end of the day, we all know as a business owner, we get a little perks here or there. We have a car. We have telephone, maybe some gas here and there. Obviously, it's to do business. Everything's above board. But what happens is. Right. Those those are expenses of the business that reduce the net income of the business. However, they're perks for the owners. These are perks for the owners that the next owner does not have to take on. They don't have that burden. So basically, when you're out of the picture, right, their their income is going to go substantially higher. So we have to take that net income number. And then what we do is we add back items such as, let's say, your car payment, such as, let's say, a computer, your telephone. All these things will increase the value of the business Based on, you know, obviously you got the valuation of the business, you got the market, uh, the market as well as like what can it sell for, what are other practices selling for other than that, other businesses in the industry. And then the major thing is we need to go through every single item on that, on that profit and loss. And what is, what is a, the, the owner's perks in there? And then we back that and then we add that to the net income and that's what the business is worth. Because, you know, we're not going to give you, we're not going to allow you to give me, you know, money on, on a, a lower amount with all the stuff that I'm going to be taking off when you, when you receive it. So at the end of the day, that's one thing that when you are ready to sell, we take trailing two years, we take trailing one year and we figure out what expenses are your perks. And then we back that out, we add that to the net income. So then that adds value to your business. So that's what I love. That's like a little a little tidbit that right that you know could add up to quite substantial number that most people wouldn't think about if they're doing thinking about this on their own. Liz, and it's it you know it it happens to be where you know your and on the on the flip side of that is you're fighting with the seller right or the buyer to tell okay no this is yours no this is mine no this is still going to occur. So even though I'm going through one right now with two partners here. And, you know, it. we literally, we're going back and forth saying, okay, you didn't have a correct insurance policy. So they basically want to lower it because I, I get to get more insurance. But at the end of the day, all these meals and entertainment, you know, those really weren't business deductions, but they were business deductions. But then they, they were because they were speaking with clients. But at the end of the day, that new owner doesn't need to do this, right? Because now you know, on the normal circumstances, the smaller guys going into the bigger one and they have economies of scale and your, you know, your processes are putting together so that they could save money on your gross income coming in. Makes sense. And it's funny you, you you explained it that way, John, because 
when I meet folks often, I, you know, part of my interview with them in, in the beginning is, you know, well, how much do you make? A W-2 person knows exactly, and they can give you their statement. Um, most businesses that I've met underestimate what they make annually. Well, look at the tax return. The tax return may say 100, um, but, you know, we know, like John said, it, it's really 200 because all those things John mentioned. And the, just, just trying to understand that stuff um, with with uh, with folks that look at this stuff every day is, is valuable. Um, yeah. We're, we're going to jump to step three. Now, a lot of times, you know, when we're first working with clients and business owners, the value of the company is not known. Obviously, even if it is known, and, and we start to project what we want to sell it for someday, even if that's 10 years out, and we want to translate that into the actual income that someone will have to support their lifestyle post-exit, you, you have to grow the business, right? And that requires many things, okay? So it may be labor, it may be HR, it may be equipment, it may be a whole new process, it may be patents. There's a zillion things that you may know, you know, way better than us what you need to grow the business. But we identify together that we need to grow and at what stages throughout time um, is achievable and what if this happens and this doesn't work and what if that happens and this doesn't work because it's not all just a linear straight line. Um, that's part of the process. Um, in there, you're going to find, you know, ways to to minimize taxes. Um, you know, you're also going to have to potentially look at your management team and look at them differently. Um, I usually say to a business owner to try to cement in their mind, you know, if they're going to sell to a third party, I say, if you if you can go to Costa Rica for a year and not really manage the business and the company runs without you there nice for a year, then you have a sellable business because then you're not the business. They're not buying you because you're gone. So working with management, hiring new management, hiring new talent, hiring new rainmakers, you know, I've worked with some business owners where they are the business. If you took them out, there is no business. Well, we'll, we'll work together, you know, with, with various other functional people that we have that are in HR, you know, a lot of a lot of things are um, cropping up today that um, I'm looking for the word um, where we where CEOs step into companies or HR people. They're fractional people, right? We know all those people because that, you know, we can't leave you with the growth initiative without having at least a partner to talk to. Because that's another piece of uh, the business owner's life that's very time consuming. It's very frustrating. You know, you may be in business and you're making a product and that's what you love or your service. You may not be an expert in HR. You may not be an expert in, in insurance around, you know, the, the, the company and the employees. But we also have folks in our, uh, on our deep bench that help business owners accomplish these other things that we've identified together as being super important because they could be barriers to future growth or barriers to even, you know, um, you know, mo moving one step forward. So we recognize that and that comes in this area. Um, also, you know, um, you, you know, you may look at your employees differently through this kind of a process. I've had a few business owners do that because, they are the key sometimes critically to, to you getting out. Um, and that's also hard. And, we, you know, we know that, that, that giving up that mentality of I'm the guy, um, you know, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but someday if you, if you want to exit your business, that there will be a shift in there and hopefully, you know, we can help you do that. Um, right. John, any other comments? Well, that basically, Tom, all that you really leading everything into into step four and five with right with the employee, um, with you know, with the possible employee, because that's really do we have do we have somebody in place that loves the business that takes care of the business as if it's their own, 
and maybe want to, you know, they would be the next person to take over, buy it. You know, so that that's a whole scenario in and itself. And yes, we want to every year you want to maximize the growth. Really, what we have to understand, it's very hard because, you know, look, we're the ones that, you know, sweat and effort. We're the ones that put everything into this, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And at the end of the day, you know, us doing something like, let's say, stuffing the envelopes. Or something, we need to make sure that we delegate those responsibilities. And it's so hard because really what we want to do is you know, we want to make sure our clients, you know, they're satisfied. Customers are satisfied, you know, and at that point, you know, we, we're going to go above and beyond to do that. But you also have to factor in where, you know, your time value of money, right? What you're doing, right? Is it benefiting the business and eventually the clients or so? So you got to sometimes step back and delegate delegate the responsibility. And it truly, it's very hard. I mean, I it's very hard. I mean, I, I can, from my experience, I can tell you it's hard. But um, every year we should be looking at minimizing the tax burden every year. Um, realistically, you know, as business owners, there's no more, there's no more, uh, even jobs right now, FedEx stopped their 401k, I think a year or two ago that, you know, there's no pensions out there. There's no retirement. Account. You have to, as the business owner, do it yourself. So, you know, that's an element too, that you have to understand that's for your retirement, because this is really, how do I generate the same amount of income during my years of retirement that I am earning right now as I work. I don't want to change my lifestyle. Yes, the kids are probably going to ask for larger numbers. The sneakers are out of the door. Now I need $20,000. But we, at the end of the day, we just need to figure out how are we going to have the same money and have the same lifestyle that we're going to live during retirement that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And as you said, it is hard, which is why it's important to reach out for this type of assistance because it's hard to do it, not just because you are working in your business, but also just because it's a mind shift. It is. It is a mind shift. And, and very hard. I'm I would still say mind one, shifting myself. <laughs> I would mention one other thing to tag along with kind of John said has been, been my experience. Um, companies that have been able to do well um, you know, and they want to give their key executives uh, or even partners more money. Um, you know, the common approach is to just pay them in in salary or an additional bonus, which really uh, really shows up as ordinary income, and and the, and they're just paying higher taxes as they make more money. So if you find out that your employees or yourself, you're complaining about how much, you know, Uncle Sam gets a piece of. There are a lot of other ways to help change that scenario where the employee is still betting, benefiting tremendously and not having such a tax burden of just, um, you know, getting hit at the end of the year with, you know, an extra $100,000 or 50000 or whatever the number is. And there is plenty of ways from a planning standpoint and a strategy standpoint that we could put money, that money to better use, whether it be future retirement or other perks that won't be taxed. Um, that's also fairly uncommon um, in, in, in the business world, in the business owner world. Um, so what about step five? Is that another type of way to sell? If it's not within your organization or within your family, you help people figure this out too. What was that, Elizabeth? That is step, she. She was staying step, step five. Tom. About step five is that you know where you're moving on, moving outside of the organization and your family to a third party. Yeah. So you really only have three choices. You, you could sell to somebody that is on the inside. Uh, you could sell to a third party, or you could not sell. Right. There's no other choices. Um, so, you know, John talked a little bit about selling to insiders and that's a different process. I mean, a lot of the same steps happen, but it's slightly different uh, when you're selling to either family uh, or, or key employees that you've had working for years that are, are, are like family. Um, you know, we go through all of that um, and then going to a third party sale. So you may say, OK, well. You, and there are instances where business owners start off saying it's a, I know I'm going to sell to a third party and then they change and vice versa. So that, 
it isn't always clear. Just so you know, a lot of this stuff isn't clear at the beginning. Um, so whether we're talking about a strategic buyer or a competitor, a competitor buying you out, or you know, doing a private equity sale, we have you know partners again in in our group that are investment bankers, business brokers. So when it's time to sell, or when you're approaching sale and you have to market your business, you know, we also are in help in that space tremendously because it's on this continuum of this whole seven step process. Um, if you have to, I had a business sale last year that was a global business, right? So they weren't just marketing to America. They were marketing globally. That's where they were going to get their best money. Um, so that is very important because the time and energy for a business owner to go out and set up these appointments with brokers and vet, all of this stuff takes so much time. Um, but we kind of have the network there already um, in, in place. And, and again, kind of how what John was saying, you know, the more work we do along this, this timeline, the higher you're going to be able, the greatest value you're going to be able to create for the business and the higher sale price you're going to get. And hopefully if we're doing all the other right things too, you'll pay the least amount of tax. Um, so it's kind of a, a really neat way to kind of look at the, the whole process. Um, right. And, and Tom, you, Tom, and in regards to, and just to, to elaborate that on a little, like he's showing private equity in there, strategic buyer. The one, the last one is the employee, uh, you know, stock ownership. Now, at the end of the day, we, he's going to decide whether we're going to do a key employee, right? Or we're going to do a family member. And then, you know, if we can't, we're going to do one of those. We're going to do a private equity. Let me just tell you, you know, what's going on right now in the insurance companies, all these uh, small little insurance agents, all these small little dental practices right now. There are huge hedge funds, not hedge funds, private equity funds that are literally buying up all these small little companies because they're not worried about necessarily, you know, you in there. They're worried about the income. They're just looking about having more income into their in, in, into their one company. So they're basically going to buy, buy you out. And a private equity, you know, let's say that private equity company, you know, they might go public eventually or something to that nature. With the employee stock option is, you know, where you might actually take 75% um, cash from your private sale and then 25% in an employee stock option with where you could take it from there. But you, you, we, either way, right. Either way, we're going to go through the same process. He's the family member more than likely they'll have, you know, uh, they'll be asking for a discount or so, but at the end of the day, you know, it, like Tom said, the processes are pretty much the same. We just, everything is going to be tailored. But this is also, we step into step six is where Tom was going to elaborate on, you know, certain agreements that we put into place so that we don't have an issue, you know, because if one of your partners, you know, is, is not related now, you know, now we have a situation, right? You know, as far as who wants to buy who, what if somebody wants to die, uh, God forbid dies. So realistically, we have to figure out how are we going to take care of that if an event occurs before the sale? Mm. Yes. And and before we go into that, John, you, you want to talk a little bit about just quickly the, you know, what type of structure different businesses are in, like whether they're an S corp or a C corp, because I know yeah. a lot of people ask questions about that. Right. Um, and realistically, um, um, realistically, there are so many ways here, right? It depends on what the structure is, like a C corporation, right? Then th the C corporation normally has double taxation with it. Then you have you know, a partnership, you have a sole proprietorship, right? So like a sole proprietorship, basically, you know, if, if, if it's a service-based business, what you would be doing, if this is a one owner or a single member LLC, You'll be basically selling your your, you know, if there's if it was a dental practice, you'll be selling the equipment, maybe the the furniture, whatever. But everything else really is the goodwill. It's your name and your client base. So the goodwill is basically what we would be selling, right? That's really where the meat and potatoes are because of the income that you're generating. So there's so many ways that it can be structured. And I, I do have, you know, at the end, I, I'd like to go over one example of, of, of how to avoid such pitfalls on that because, you know, the tax burden, if it's a C corporation could be, could be, you know, astronomical. And also you have to feel, you have to realize, you know, 
New York City in itself has a separate tax element too, which is 8.85% if you're an S or a C Corp. So we got to factor those into our, our equation because there's ways that we could actually sell the assets of the business or we could sell the stock of the business. And that those in, in itself are different tax brackets alone. Hmm. So much to know. Yeah, a lot of stuff. So quickly on business continuity, just a lot of businesses have partners, don't have agreements, and it's good to be intentional here, very intentional. And a lot of times business is done on a handshake. You know, we'll we'll try to, you know, do everything we can to make sure that there's agreements in place or so something happens to partners. If they're sick, if they get divorced, if they're if they pass away, if they go bankrupt, you know, what happens to all the other partners? You know, how do they take care of each other? The business has value, right? It's a there's stock in the business. So it can't it can't just go poof into nothing if something happens unforeseen or unplanned. A lot of these things that happen are not planned, right? But we but they happen and they happen, you know frequently enough that we can put things in place to kind of protect the company and protect the partners of the company and, and overall the firm. So, you know, between buy sell agreements, we, you know, attorneys get involved, accountants like John, uh, myself, uh, handling um, all these different agreements to make sure that like when you go to sleep at night, everything's protected and accounted for if some things happen. Okay. If don't if things don't happen, we'll we'll still have provisions, you know, that cover all those other areas. But it's a lot of times this isn't an, this is an area that can be done very uh, upfront in a business and never really have to be you know looked at you know that often. Not that you not, not that you can just put it away, but it's good to get a foundation set in the in this space of step six. Um, Fantastic. And and step seven again. What we're trying to do here is make make sure that whatever we talked about in step one happens, okay? And then you know the business owner is out of the business at this point. Um, you know he could maybe still be working a little bit um, and taking an annuity out of the company or taking a paycheck, but for the most part he's relinquished the reins, um, and he's going to have. Or she's going to have, you know, wishes for how the family's treated, with the money that's generated from the business, and 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 when, you know, say over time when the 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 the, the business owner and his spouse pass away, right? The wealth transfer strategies. There's a lot of tax implications here that we could help with, and and strategies. But it's again. The only thing I'm going to say additionally, it's all inclusive and it really goes back to step one and tries to tie together everything that we started in step one to make sure it's efficient, uh, to make sure the, the, the wealth is transferred through the family or the wishes of the business owners. And it, and it happens in, in, a, in a timely fashion with, with not a lot of headaches and, and the most favorable outcome. Right. And the the state planning just to, you know, it's very involved, but, you know, with the exemption at 13 million for the federal and around six and a half, seven million on for New York state, you know, if your assets are under those numbers, right, what happens is it's something called step up in basis, meaning if you bought a, pro a building for $100,000 um, in 2030 years ago, and it's worth a million dollars, if you are completely, completely underneath that six and a half, seven million threshold and 13 million on the federal, which basically, I mean, it's the same thing. If you're under seven million, realistically, we would get the, the day that you die, that goes to a million dollars. So that means if I sold it the day before you died, it's $900,000 of capital gains. The day after you die, the, the beneficiaries would literally have a loss because of the closing cost in itself right because now it steps up so really it steps up that's why that exemption is really big the 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 uh the exemption for the lifetime it's a, a major number and tax strategies can be really if you implement it right there'll be no tax and we're talking millions of dollars for uh for the for the uh, beneficiaries you know could be from the business could be from other personal assets but the, the only reason why I say, but there's also structures that, you know, if the building's inside a corporation, now we have to discuss in a little bit further fashion because we have to strategize because once something is tangled up in an entity, 
right? We only have to deal with the outside of it. Um, so we have to get upon somebody passing, we have to get them to merge together. And that's what would happen upon passing. And, you know, but there can be, a, a, I mean, I'm talking about hundreds to millions of dollars being saved on tax on tax dollars if your estate planning is in order. Mm. Wow, that's Yes, really and just, just to leave you with one thing on that, because it's a heavy subject, if just for argument's sake, if you know going into your retirement and later years, you're going to have a $10 million tax bill, we can plan for that so it goes away. And if you don't plan for it, People complain all the time and you hear it wherever at a family dinner or somewhere out or your, you know, friend's party that, you know, what I had to do, but just uh, trust us on this one. There, there's enough stuff out there that you can kind of erase a lot of those painful, uh, you know, financial um, situations that, that come down the road. So very much to know. So, you know, what would be great is could each of you share with us like a story of you know the experiences that you've had with some clients maybe each one of you could share something to kind of bring home the the importance of all of all of following these steps and, and and working with professionals john you want to go first or you want me to go okay so um i had a client right basically um the building was in a c corporation right so the building was in a c corporation worth a certain amount of uh, let's say it's worth four million dollars Right. At the end of the day, understand C corporations in order to get the money out, it's got to be either through salary, uh, uh, salary or a dividend. Right. So this is rental income. We're not going to generate, you know, Social Security and Medicare tax on unearned income. So we're going to leave it as ordinary income on there. So at the end of the day, the mother passed away. The mother passed away. It's a four million dollar property, but they bought, she bought it in 1962. Right. So at the end of the day. It's $4 million if just because she was under the under the $7 million. So technically, the stock of that corporation moved up, as I was saying before, to $4 million. However, the basis inside the actual um, inside the actual C corporation of the building is still 100. So basically, what you have to do is you have to pay the taxes inside and then you distribute it out and then it'll offset against that higher number. But because it's it's um, with inside the entity itself, we still got to pay New York State, federal and, and New York City taxes. A way around that basically is maybe we convert to a C corporation, right? Maybe we we, we convert to a C corporation where, you know, it, it's not double taxation. It flows down to you personally. So let's say I do have a, a $4 million gain. However, because I, if I dissolve the business in the same year, I know I know I'm talking a little complex, but I'm just trying to if I have a four million dollar gain that flows down to me personally. Remember, my mom passed away and it was four million dollars. Right. It was four million dollars. That's a that's a capital loss. So if I actually sell the building and the property in the same year. Basically, I don't pay any, you know, then uh, on an S corporation, there's no tax. But if you keep it in the C-Corp, so you have to let the S-Corporation, you know, because normally real, real estate's not in C-Corporations. They used to do that years ago. You have to really LLCs are the way to go. So we have to strategize. Or just one other thing before before Tom goes is what if we sell? What if we sell to the brother? What if we sell to the sister? That two million, they're worth $2 million each. They own the stock of $2 million each realistically if they sold it to their brother for just the stock now there's no tax zero tax now i own the whole thing as the, the sister and the brother paid nothing i have the four million dollars and then we strategize how maybe we make it an s election right so it flows down to you personally so god forbid anything does happen we can merge them and pay no tax so there's a lot i mean because we're talking about a million and a half dollars of taxes on that four million dollars Plus closing cost. We don't have to sell the building necessarily to sell it to somebody else. We could sell the shares, the shares of that, and that could be offset. So these are, I apologize if I got a little, uh, you know, uh, convoluted on there, but I just wanted to understand that it's very important um, that we strategize this because we could save millions. And, you know, now you have two, a brother and sister, you know, do you want 4 million in cash or do you want 2 million and two and a half million in cash? 
So you know, that, it's a it's a big difference. And that's generational. That's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars each. That's generational money. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I have a um a little less complicated story. Um, but you'll the reason I chose this story is I want you to try to get a feel. I mean, we're talking only for 45 minutes here. What some of the things, what comes up during this process? Um, so I have um, a, a client, they're two brothers. They're, they're both partners in a New Jersey business. Um, and their goal when I first started sitting down with them was to sell the business in New Jersey and start a new business in Florida because that's, that's where they wanted to retire. And they're both in their low 60s. So as literally, the, I think it was the second time I was meeting them, I said, wow, man, that just sounds like a tough lift. You know, I don't think I would want to start up a business in my 60s in a new state and get new clients. So I just kind of sat there and we were going through the process. Um, then we did some initial planning for them. But there was a lot of, a lot of belly aching, a lot of resistance to kind of doing stuff. And then literally after a year working with them, they realized that that plan was horrendous. They didn't want that plan at all. Um, and I, you know, I joked with them and I said, you know, do you think you would have even got to this conclusion if we didn't even just sit down and start, you know, hashing out what's possible? And they said, no, ah, we probably would have been in the same boat just saying, ah, yeah, we're going to move to Florida someday, you know, and just keep working. So a lot of times it flushes out these really important things that people want, right? What is your business going to bring you both in, in money and, and joy and, and dignity, and, but, but, you know, your lifestyle, your fun, you know, so it, it does actually bring those things out. So, that, so what we did then was um, we pivoted. And I said, okay, well, the reason why they were selling it was because they had no one inside that could run the business, right? They had technicians, they had people with super expertise, but they didn't have two brothers that were business minded that could run the business. And there was nobody inside. So they had to think about selling it. So they were also at a technological uh, uh what am I looking to say? They were uh, crossroads in the business. And there, being that they were in their 60s, they didn't want to cross that technological th uh, crossroad because they didn't have the energy. So their goal and their new plan now is they knew two other guys, younger guys in their 30s that they hired that had all this technical expertise that they wanted nothing to do with. So they've, they're transferring their entire business model, and it's going to take five years, which they're totally fine with, but they're going to transfer um, and do a hybrid business and then transfer in five to seven years to these two younger gentlemen. Everything's in writing. Everything's figured out at this point. Now they just got to make the new business work. And the new model is actually easier from even a sales perspective than the, than their business that they ran for 30 years. So I'm only saying that because this is something that happens to businesses all the time. Um, it was a great uh, realization for them uh, to, to go that route because they're so happy that, you know, they figured something out that really made sense to them. And, you know, it's uh, hopefully you know, works, but I think it's going to be a much better plan than them, than what they originally thought of, uh, which could have been very hard. It's a really good example of, of what gaining the expertise and really working through, because we all have ideas in our head and there's not a lot of clarity there until we really get working on it. And when we're working in our, in our business, it's really hard to work on our business without without additional help. So Absolutely. that's really a really great example. So, you know, if people, I, I did put your contact information in the chat. Let me just have you tell me, you know, what can someone expect? So, you know, they, they're they interested, they 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 have a business, they do, are planning, would like to plan to sell it. You know, what, what can they expect when they reach out? What would be the first step, let's just say? Well, um, they, Everyone here heard a little bit about it, so they have some idea. Um, we we have a very easy assessment that you could take 
it's 10 questions um, and it really just identifies, you know, the things that are on your mind about your business. You know, what things you think are going on that are good, what things do you need help with, what things keep you up at night, um, where are the pain points and it prioritizes them. It's very simple. Um, it takes, you know, five or 10 minutes to fill it out. And then that gives us a liftoff point to, you know, where do, where do we start the discussion? Where do we start the conversation? You know, we know we have the seven steps, but that's not, the, you know, all these things that come up are within those steps. Mm -hmm. And it helps clarify, you know, where business owners are and um, very helpful for us because we, we can't do anything without you. I mean, you're leading us. We're, we're just advising and coaching, but it's, it's, it's your life that we want, you know, to help you uh, achieve whatever, whatever it is, um, you know, a, as a business owner. Right. And if you look, if, if you needed any type of, you know, if you want any analysis of, of, of your, your business itself, just to see really where, where did, um, if you want to make any, uh, moves on the the you know expenses or anything to that nature if you want to figure out really you know the current stuff because obviously one of the one of the steps is your current situation so if you wanted to go over um and, and just go through an analysis of your profit and loss and everything to that nature what we have on the tax returns you know please feel free to reach out to me and if there's anybody that needs anything in regards to tax season knowing that we're we're uh what's called i know i won't be sleeping on weekends for the next three months so it's okay but uh yeah. if there's we're anybody that me... here for the webinar before yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, right um i i got here i got here but um at the end of the day uh if, if anybody needs any help um we're here to help and you know these are stuff that really you need to take off you know it, it's not that you're taking it off your plate it's just that really what you're trying to do is you're just trying to implement the plan that's best for you and your family yeah, and have, and have some assistance. By the way, John slept all winter and he just came out of hibernation. <laughs> He's very well rested. Yes, <laughs> like a sure. bear. For sure. Uh, what what I'm gonna everyone who's on this call will receive um the uh recording of this. You'll also receive Tom and John's contact information, although I also put it in the chat now. Um, so you know, really the next step it, it, the important next step is is to reach out. And get started um, because that's, you know, where you can kind of see how you can outline your future. I think the two of you did such a phenomenal job of, of helping us understand why it's important to really put effort and expertise behind your business so that you can plan for the future and you can make sure both on the succession and on the taxing, you know, what is the best way to go to keep the most amount of money in your pocket. Right. Absolutely. That's so the thank name of the you. Game. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to thank all of our attendees for being with us and spending that time. Please reach out to Tom and John and have your questions answered. I know a lot of them are very intricate. We had some questions about, can you put this in a trust and about, um, about, uh, different kinds of businesses, franchises versus other types of businesses, but reach out, reach out to Tom and John and they can speak to your needs specifically and help you gain clarity, which right. is so very important. And Liz, just to, just to, with the, that last one that you said, when in regards to the franchise, realistically, it's the entity itself that that person okay. has that determines what, you know, what the, if it's an LLC, a C corp or S corporation. And the only other caveat that I see would be if the franchise is looking for some extra money upon the sale. So you got to look at your franchise agreement on there, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, it's really, it's the same exact, um, it would be the same structure that any other structure would go. We just have to do, we have to add the franchise into the equation. Perfect. Thank you so much. What a great way to end it. Thanks again, uh, Tom, John. Thanks everyone for joining happy us. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, happy New Year. Year. Thank stay, you for, stay healthy and we'll see you on a- Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.